What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Welcome back to another episode of uh, Do It For A Living. This is Kevin from My Shop Assist. Um, this week we've got Matt Beanin. Uh, he has been a guest on our show before um, when he was working for Grimspeed. Um, and since then, things have changed for him significantly. Um, he is now with Built Right Industries, a business he has started, I guess, from the side and built it into what is pretty amazing growth that he's gotten to what it is today. Um, and I'm really excited to hear... We're not going to go into the background of Matt because we've already heard that in the previous podcast. We'll we'll share a link if you want to hear the original one, kind of like what got him into this industry. But uh, today we're just going to talk about what spurred this idea and building it into a business and then growing it to where it is now. And I mean, he does this full time. So Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me back. Cool. So yeah, once again, congratulations on this business. I, I'm I follow you. We're friends on Facebook. I, I think I've only met you maybe at one of the Seymour PRI shows, maybe once or twice. Yeah, we've crossed paths. Yeah. Um, but uh, I follow you on Facebook, and I love seeing all your updates, like literally from you doing it like out of your garage into, <laughs> you know, like you have a warehouse and everything. So it's uh, it's really impressive to see what you've done. So why don't you go ahead and get us started like uh, from – where we talked last, you were still, I think, vice president at um, Grimspeed. And if I had to guess, this was probably something you were tinkering with on the side at the time. Um, so kind of like take us from that point to, you know, where you got the business, where you quit Grimspeed. Yeah. So I actually, I had to kind of go back and look at a calendar to make sure that I had my dates right. The last couple of years have been uh, a bit of a blur to say the least. Um, but yeah, so you and I, <laughs> you and I spoke in the fall of 2016. At the time I was the president of Grimspeed. And I think I had mentioned to you that I had a 2016 F-150 as a daily driver. And I was having kind of fun on the side, sort of being an enthusiast again, you know, Subarus kind of became work. Uh, they, they were work. And I, I, I was having fun kind of with this thing that was totally new to me. Um, and at the time when we spoke, um, all I had was an idea. Okay. And at the time, I thought it was a mediocre idea and um, kind of I, I decided. So I know you said we're not going to go back. I'm going to go back a little bit. Okay. When I was 13, I was always entrepreneurial. When I was 13 or 14, I had this idea to start a business. Uh, the Internet, as we use it today, was kind of just starting to become a thing. And I had this idea that I want to start a small local classifieds business. But okay. I didn't have the computer I needed, yada, yada, yada. And for my 14th birthday, my parents gave me a $1,200 uh, zero interest loan okay. to go and buy that computer and pursue that business idea. I think I bought the computer. I know I paid the loan back, but the kind of, you know, there's a lot of distraction and, and all of that. But all that to say is this entrepreneurial spirit uh, and, and need to like kind of tinker in that area is, it was, is in my blood. <clears throat> so uh, fast forward, you and I are speaking and I've got this idea and um, I kind of, uh, I kind of become. I was coming coming to the realization that um, Grimspeed wasn't a career path that was going to ultimately fulfill what it was that I wanted to do. Okay. I knew that I wanted to be a business owner or a business partner and really have that sense of ownership uh -huh. that I think you can't otherwise get okay. um, as an employee, maybe to the same extent. Which is a and, lot of and, what this podcast is about, because a lot of people, you were kind of interviewed as an employee, not necessarily the owner, and yes. a lot of people are the owners, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I remember, I recall listening to the other uh, interviewees who were the owners and being envious of that additional hunger and drive that I think that, well, that I know now that you feel when you really have uh, everything at stake. And I remember you asked me when I left um, my big comfy uh, defense industry job, um, you know, moving to a small business was, you know, a lot of less, a lot of risk and a little bit of reward. Uh -huh. And um, so I kind of ultimately I got to the point at Grim Speed where um, I was enjoying what I was doing there, but I had this this kind of need festering, and I kind of ultimately decided that the the riskiest thing for me to do would be to continue being an employee somewhere where I didn't feel like I was moving towards sort of this ultimate goal or ultimate calling. Um, 
<clears throat> and so I had this idea and I had that small, I, I had come across that birthday card with the, with the, uh, zero interest loan, uh, cleaning out my house. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to put that same $1,200 into a small business checking account. And I've got this little mediocre idea. And I had, you know, everybody, I think when you kind of want to start a business, you're waiting for this perfect idea, the silver bullet, that's gonna, you know, you're going to make it and it's going to go well and blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh -huh. And I kind of just decided I'm tired of having these ideas that I think are pretty good. And then in hindsight, wishing I had chase them down. <laughs> right, right. So I did that. Right. So I made uh, 50 units of this little latch release that I had. Um, and it was something that I kind of, again, it was, it was, a it was a nights and weekends hobby kind of thing. I, I cut the prototypes out of cardboard with scissors, um, really just tinkering with it. And I made them and I used one myself and I sold um, a handful to a friend and I think a few of his coworkers. And, and for and so people I have, who aren't familiar, it's a latch to like pop the back seat to fold down or something, right? Yeah, it's a very basic thing, and I, I won't I won't bore you with kind of the entire function of it. But yeah, it's it's a little thirty five dollar item. It allows you to drop the back seat of the F one fifty down, and there's some storage space and stuff back gotcha. there. Okay. Yeah, so I so I had these extras sitting around, and I I so this was uh, very late in 2016. And in February of 2017, I kind of, I was this, this kind of need to start a business was continuing to fester. Um, and so I got a little bit of legal advice and I started a website, builtrightindustries.com. And I put the rest of these rear seat releases up there for sale. And I remember it was February 3rd. It was a Friday and I put them up there for sale and I went on Facebook and I found a little, a small F-150 group and, and kind of like sneakily said, Hey, has anybody seen this neat little invention? Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> right. And I posted Guerrilla a link. Marketing. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember I sat down to watch a movie with my wife and my phone buzzed, you know, 12 minutes later or something. And I had sold one. Um, and then throughout the course of that, that movie, a couple of hours, I sold 12 or 15. I kind of thought, Hey, you know, maybe this is, maybe this mediocre idea is mediocre enough <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that, I, that I should make more. And I sold, I sold everything I had that weekend um, and kind of, you know, back to work on Monday, collected my thoughts throughout the week and uh, decided to order more just using the, the proceeds from that original um, okay. uh, batch. Yep. Um, so I did that and I kind of continued to cycle on that um, over and over and over again over the course of the next, I guess it was a few months. And uh, in June of 2017 is when I ultimately made the decision to uh, begin transitioning out of Grimspeed. Okay. Um, we didn't set an end date. I, I, feel, I felt um, a lot of loyalty and, and responsibility to try to take care of the guys that worked for me there. And I, I really, I loved what we had built. Okay. Um, but, I, you know, I, I knew that we needed to part ways there. So you were um, basically, uh, you, were, you were willingly helping to train your replacement then at that point, right? <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's essentially. Um, and I, I didn't end up having, I wasn't given a replacement to train. And so, uh, long story short is, um, I was, I was, I was there for another four months okay. until October and, um, kind of to answer your, to answer your question is I don't really even, th I didn't really think of it at the time as starting one business in order to leave another. They felt to me like separate, separate things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess I'm not sure how to organize that more clearly in my head, but I just didn't think of it because at the time. So in June, when I decided to, to leave, um, I had every intention of getting another full-time job. Okay. Um, I wanted to either be, like I said, working towards being a partner or a business owner, or I wanted to work again in a larger organization and have a mentor and some leadership and, and continue to grow professionally um, in that way. Gotcha. Okay. So in June, and I, I went back and looked actually before we hopped on this call in June, I sold about $2,500 worth of these little, um, seat releases. Okay. That's so needless to say that was one month, to... right? Or is that total to it, that it, time? It was, no, that was one month. Okay. That's pretty that was decent. one month. So uh -huh. yeah, so it had some traction, right? It had some legs. I knew that I was onto something, but it wasn't a quit, quit your job, you know, and, and, and chase it down. It didn't feel like that to okay. me. Um, so I continued working at Grimspeed and that continued to be a, you know, eight, nine, 10 hour days type of thing. I felt, you know, like I said, I felt some ownership there. Mm -hmm. Um, and in October, actually the week after I left, 
Um, I had a job interview that went really well. I was going to be the, uh, the director of product development at a, a, a major toy company. And it wasn't until I, that was, it was kind of ready to uh, make a decision there that I realized that there was really no decision to be made and that I had to pursue um, built right full time. Okay. So, you know, I had, I had some savings and YOLO, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like I said before, it's, it's, it felt like the most in a very strange way, it felt like the most risky, irresponsible decision would be for me to <laughs> back burner this, this thing that I was growing. Um, and I think I, I was one of the only people that didn't, that didn't see it like that until that moment. But I would even be interviewing with people and say, you know, use as an example of my ability to execute, you know, I have this little side business and they're, and they're like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so that was kind of, but it really had to, it had to be, I had to get to that decision point in order to feel like it's time to take a crack at it. Cool. Okay. And so you, you were, uh, you, you transitioned out of, um, group speed and you're doing, um, built right. Obviously at $2,500 in sales a month, you're not going to be paying yourself. Right. <laughs> so is this kind of like the, the, the realization that this just got real, real fast? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it kind of, you know, it had time to set in after I had given notice and I had about four months to kind of work myself up into a panic. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, I was, I was, yeah, I thought I was going to get another job. Um, so there wasn't really a moment where like this just got real. It just got, it got exciting. Okay. I mean, when you have something kind of in the back of your head or that you're playing around with part time. Um, and I've had other people call me since, you know, we chatted the first time and have kind of heard my story and ask for advice. And if any of you listening want to, uh, have, want somebody to convince you to quit your job, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you can start dedicating yourself full time to it, it's a, it's a game changer. Okay, cool. Okay. So you're making this little latch, but, um, I mean, that has grown substantially. It's not just the latch anymore, right? Yes. Yeah. So I continued to play on this original $1,200 investment um, kind of as a challenge to myself. And also that made me feel like I was managing my my level of risk financially. Okay. Um, and so when I had a little bit of extra money from doing that, I would um, begin prototyping other products. And this next product that I had was the bedside rack system, uh -huh. which sort of is now the backbone of the company. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, I, I designed that and I had prototypes cut and kind of went through the whole process there. And then when I ordered my first production run of that, that was kind of the most intimidating point, I think there in the beginning, cause okay. that was, you know, laying out thousands and thousands of dollars that I, you know, needed to use to pay my mortgage, um, and hoping I could flip them. So, right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, kind of, Walk us through the, 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 the phases of your business. So you were doing it out of your garage for a while, and I remember you were printing. I remember seeing Facebook pictures of you uh, printing uh, shipping receipts, and like it was like a mile long, that, that printer was just printing them as fast as it could, essentially, right? <laughs> How does yeah, that work yeah, out the, of your house? <laughs> the basement, I kind of took over the basement, and that turned into kind of a production and fulfillment facility. Um, I had a... I had bought a Singer sewing machine and I was sewing these pull straps myself um, and then boxing up the product and slapping labels on them. And then uh, every single morning I would drive to the post office and drop off my packages and pick up e empty bins there uh -huh. um, and take them back home. And, and then it, as we continued to grow and I got to these bedside racks, which are much larger, uh, we took over the garage and then um, – uh, a few storage units at a local storage unit place. So for, um, let's see, the winter of 2018, 2017, 2018, my routine was to be working at uh, in the basement and garage, fulfilling orders from the previous day. Uh -huh. And then in the afternoon and evening, I would go to the storage unit with a gas power generator, <clears throat> set up some lights and be there to receive new inventory and to pick up the parts that I thought I would need to fulfill the next day's uh, orders. Okay. So it was a very uh, disorganized, well, I mean, you had a system, but it was very, it's very inefficient. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like the most organized, bad system you could imagine. <laughs> you know, it's like you do what you have to do. And I didn't have other options at the time. Yep. Um, and I, and I did what I could to 
reduce friction. So I have my website and my shipping service and everything set up to be as smooth and frictionless as possible. But at some point, you're driving to the storage unit at 11 o'clock and your hands are freezing while you're digging through these parts. Cause it's just, yeah, you, you do what you have to do to, to get it done and get to the next day. Okay. Have you had like a worse experience, you know, getting this thing going and getting it off the ground? Uh, uh yeah, yes. You know, I, I, I remember struggling with this question the first time you asked it. Um, and I've got a real answer now. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that the, the summer after, uh, let's see. The summer that I started selling those rear seat release kits, I started selling them on Amazon through their uh, FBA or Fulfilled by Amazon program via Prime. Um, and that really, really helped grow sales. And the the problem with that is because Amazon publishes their sales trends and your product ranking, yeah. there are software packages where people can track that. Okay. And what I learned, what I know now is that if you – were to if you could go back in time and you could sort products using this tracker by things that are small, they're lightweight, they're low priced, yeah, and they're trending really highly in sales. My product was the one that came up okay. uh, in in the F one fifty area. Okay. So all of that to say, it got knocked off, and um, not just knocked off, but counterfeited. They because my logo is a gear, the the knockoff artists, I'll call them, were cutting my logo into the parts because they didn't understand they don't they don't understand the function of it they thought that the sure. gear was a piece of it so okay. now i've got customers calling me saying you know i bought i bought your rear seat release on amazon because it was cheaper but you know the strap you know the metal is sharp so i used it 10 times and it cut the through strap. the strap oh okay and, and so i get the parts back and i you know it's not it's not something that i made okay um so uh, we've had patents pending uh, but they, the these the sellers on Amazon, have seen enough traction that they've actually hired uh, an American law firm to fight the grant of our patent. Okay. So um, that's kind of an ongoing process, huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is it's really absurd. I, I mean, you know, it's, and I'm not, I don't get angry about it because I understand that that it that that's just the way that it is. Sure. Um, that's the way that they do business, and a lot of them make a living like that, and. I knew that going into it. And um, the truth is, if I could go back in time and do it all over again without the benefit of hindsight, I think I would still do it the same way because the Amazon sales offered me this runway and the, this, this sales and this ability to build a brand that I wouldn't have otherwise had myself. Uh -huh. um, all of that being said, I can use those same tools that they used to see that in 2019, um, I lost... Uh, I lost around a half a million dollars in sales to those knockoffs from that one. Product. So to that one product. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's, it's lessons learned and I'm, you know, I'm the most enjoyment that I get out of this is, is learning and the educational process and, and kind of that's, you know, that's a part of it. And you wrote, so. you wrote a, a blog about this that went pretty viral too, didn't you? About the yeah, so I, Amazon yeah, ripping yeah. everybody off or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wrote a. I I figured that LinkedIn was maybe the most appropriate way to communicate that. I wasn't trying to complain, and I wasn't mad at Amazon. It's more of a heads up because I know that there are a lot of small businesses with these little products, and yeah. um, I still see it today, and people are still talking about. It. In fact, it's it's really being talked about more now. Um, that you just understand going into it that you're opening yourself up to that. Um, so, and, and that, yeah, I kind of went viral and I actually, I heard from people at Amazon um, and there's really nothing anybody can do. In fact, I learned that a lot of Amazon employees are, are actually doing that um, as long as we're talking about side businesses here. So, so they're it's actually, kind of a, they're actually scouring <laughs> their own system for things that they can rip off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's, and I, I spoke to three different Amazon employees as a result of that article and they, they try trying to help me. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the basis of that phone call or email was always, I sell on the side, so I know exactly how they do this. Here's how they do it, but there's nothing really we can do. Um, you can try X, Y, Z. And it was all this sort of, yeah. um, you know, end round, you know, back way kind of stuff. It that sounds it like if you had an unlimited amount of money to throw at a lawyer, you could sue <laughs> somebody, but. Since that is not the yeah. case, <laughs> you just kind of yeah, move well, on, Yeah, well, right? the thing is, I mean, as a small business, I'm, you know, I've, I've got $30,000 into this patent process. Um, 
And the the problem is they're the the people that are knocking this stuff off. They're they're so good at it. They have they have the resources too. Yeah. You know, it's not it's uh, and you got to find them. You got to know. You don't even know who to contact. So you need to hire private investigators oversee. It's it's a really it's quite a process. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> So, all right. So, okay. So take us to where you're at right now. So what is the facility you're in at this moment? Yes. So right now we are in uh, just under 5,000 square feet. Okay. Um, so bigger, kind than, of bigger open, than your, bigger than your garage and basement, bigger than the garage and the basement. Yep. <laughs> a little bit more usable, less stairs. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And, and we've just got a small office up front, Okay. you know, space for four or five employees. Um, and then it's, it's a uh, heated warehouse and back. Okay. And how many people are working with you? There are two of us right now, full time, and a couple of part time people. Okay, and so you are actually able to pay yourself now. You're not doing it all pro bono as an <laughs> entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of necessity, but also, yeah, it's kind of, um, you know, I, I I don't have a specific uh, business plan, but yeah, I had I had a, a a strategy going into it that would allow me to pay myself, and you know, I'm I'm past the point where I can kind of, you know, I've got. Uh, a wife and I've got a one year old now and yeah. it's, I'm kind of past that, you know, eat ramen in the, uh, in the single bedroom apartment sort of, uh, phase of my life. So I needed to find a way to, to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. And so you just said you don't have a formal business plan, but I mean, do you have some direct, I mean, do you have some direction to where you want to go with this? Is there, is there, is there a path forward? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have a business plan in the sense that I, I don't, and I probably should have kind of a living document that I'm reviewing every year. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but when I, when I turned down that full-time job and you kind of said, all right, it's time to get going. Um, I did do that. And I sat down and I came up with a plan and strategy, generally a kind of a, a, a plan and a strategy that would have worked for an automotive truck aftermarket business the same way it would work for um, anything else. I wanted to diversify quickly. Um, I knew that I had this one product, but I acknowledged the risk of the, of the knockoffs and the copycats. So when that came around, it might have sank the business if I hadn't had other products in the pipeline. Okay. Um, on top of that, uh, as, on top of diversifying the product lines, I wanted to diversify the markets that I was going into. Um, you know, I had had this experience in a company that had gone deep into the Subaru market. Um, and I think that once you go really deep into one market, it can be difficult and costly to step yeah. sideways and, and into a new market. And so, for sure, yeah. So I want to do that sooner rather than later because okay. I think that it gets it gets harder. <clears throat> um, and then I wanted to build relationships. Uh, that was something that became really apparent and important to me as I started this business and and getting to know you know folks like yourself and Todd through SEMA and. Um, there's really, there's, there are so many great groups and people out there. You don't need to be sort of on your own. You know, I'm, I'm, I ran this business by myself without an employee really for a couple of years and it can feel lonely, but it doesn't, there are a lot of people doing the same thing in parallel and, uh, meeting those people and having conversations with those people has been really helpful. Okay. So that, that was, that was a documented part of my my plan okay and that was one question i wanted to ask and i don't think we've ever asked this before is do you think the do it for a living group and the stories other guests have you know like given out there has that been helpful for you like even the forum the facebook forum any of that stuff has it been helpful for you in doing this new venture yeah yeah it really has and it helped me with um it helped me with uh grim speed as well i think it's you know it can feel really isolating um, and, and, and do it for a living doesn't necessarily fix that. Right. Um, but, it, but it helps you understand that the way that you're feeling and that isolating feeling and that feeling like, you know, sometimes you're, you're on your own and, um, you know, there's a lot of stress and pressure that can be associated with it. Um, it helps you and it helped me at least see that it's, that's normal. Those feelings are normal. Other people experience the same thing and are experiencing the same thing. Um, and that really helps you me at least maintain my sanity through, you know, really difficult days, weeks, months. Um, just that it's, it's not abnormal. Okay. Okay. So, um, you got this warehouse, uh, I believe you're selling to turn 14 now, right? So yes. you have wholesalers, you're not doing it all retail yourself anymore, huh? Yep. How yep. We're still primarily retail. Okay. Direct. So what brought you to but. that point where you were able to get into, I mean, 
it's not easy being able to sell your product through Turn 14 or Motivacy or any of the wholesalers, right? I mean, that, that's a process in, in and of itself. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that was um, kind of at, right after I moved. So we actually, in um, January of 2019, moved um, my family and business from Minnesota to Connecticut to be closer to family as we kind of came upon a time when, well, you know, we we're going to really try and grow the business aggressively. Um, and literally, I think two days after we moved here, I got an email from Turn 14 uh, expressing interest. I think Jeremy over there had a Raptor and had become familiar with the brand. And okay. um, it kind of one thing led to another. And I think, oh boy, it was almost a, a year or six or eight months kind of a process. Um, I wanted to make sure that the business matured far enough that we could properly service uh, them as a wholesaler and also more importantly their customers um, but you know my focus is on product design and manufacturing okay um, and if I can lean on somebody to help with logistics and sales and you know there are a lot of people that are really good at that that's what we're gonna do awesome okay so what is the most successful method you have used to promote your business I mean you said Amazon was really it, it, it stole sales, but it also kind of took you off. I mean, have you been using Facebook or Instagram or those other things, um, advertising, or how, how do you, how have you been promoting the business? Yeah. So a part of that kind of, uh, uh, business plan that I was talking about was to, in, in addition to diversifying products and, and markets is to diversify the way that we're reaching those people. So, um, we spend quite a bit on Facebook ads. I think I spend about uh, ten or twelve thousand dollars a month on Facebook advertising. Okay. Um, word of mouth is 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 something that you can't really pay for. Um, and in my customers, my demographic specifically, um, word of mouth is extremely valuable. So, um, part of that is is building relationships with customers and um, having that personal communication. Um, forums. We participate in the forums to a lesser extent. It's more of kind of a way to share what we're doing, but um, there's, it's the kind of the day-to-day -day action doesn't occur there quite like it used to, but it is definitely still a resource. Um, uh, trade shows and sponsoring people, uh, we dabble in that as well. We were an exhibitor at SEMA this year for the first time. Awesome. Um, I think we'll be back uh, in 2020 as well. Um, and then also going to not just truck shows, but um, understanding that our demographic, you know, truck owners, uh, they go to fishing tournaments and they go to okay. snowmobile races <laughs> uh -huh. and, and learning how to reach those people sort of in their world instead of inviting them into ours um, is something that I'm going to kind of work on really hard in 2020. And I'm excited about that. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, like I would have never even considered that, but you're exactly right. Like towing boats and going to hunting, hunting conventions and fishing conventions. And uh, I'm sure yep. all that kind of stuff is stuff that fits your, your demographic really, really well, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's not something that I really considered in the past either. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's kind of meeting people where they exist. And so, you know, you talk about sponsoring people. Well, it, traditionally I would have thought of that as sponsoring a Subaru show car or a, an off-road truck racer. Um, but it, for me in 2020, it's going to be working on a pro staff program with, you know, pro bass for Okay. There for example, uh -huh. um, and, and just building a brand that way. Um, you know, I don't know if there are vape shows or something that a Subaru company could sponsor, <laughs> but, but that's, I mean, that, yeah. that really is the way that I'm kind of starting to think about it. Okay. Um, and, and it's, I've, I, I've toyed with it already and it's been successful. So, and you mentioned SEMA, um, you did the launch pad. I think this is two years ago now, 2018, 2018. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So two years ago and you, for people who are not, um, uh, or don't know what the launch pad is, uh, the Young Executive Network does this kind of like Shark Tank thing where they they take uh, younger, I, I say younger, it's basically anybody under 40, if I remember, which is yeah, basically 35 everybody. 40, yeah. <laughs> but it's, yep. uh, it really is looking for people who are starting small businesses, getting started, um, new products, that sort of thing. And you pitch it, um, first you pitch it online and then you, you have like a... The popularity contest, I totally disagree with. And then, uh, but as far as like <laughs> weeding out the people, um, but once they get to the yep. the SEMA part of it at the SEMA show, it is like a full blown like Shark Tank with an audience. And it's this year was huge. I think there's a ton of people there. I haven't been to either of them. I just see the pictures and whatever videos that people post online. But yeah, you won yours in 2018. Kind of tell us what that 
encompassed and if that helped you and what value that brought to your brand? Yeah. So that, um, was the, was extremely helpful, not just winning. Winning of course is nice. There's a prize package and stuff. Um, but the, the process of it. And, and I think, you know, cause Todd did it, um, mm-hmm. you know, it really starts in like February or March and you're submitting your application. Um, and the real benefit is, you know, it gets, your name out there, you, you meet people that are in a similar position. But for me, it forced me to organize my thoughts and it forced me to, um, you know, come up with answers even to some of the questions that you're asking here um, and think about it as a business rather than just a product. And I think that that's part of the reason I was successful is to um, is to do that. But uh, yeah, that's that's a fantastic program. OK. And and they give you a booth the next year. Is that what it was? Or how did that work out? Yeah, so part of the prize package when you win is um, a booth. That's a, It's a booth space that's paid for, but it's also in a better location than you that, could normally it, get as a first-year That exhibitor. is the important part because the booth yes. cost is really – It's not that much. No, it's negligible in the cost of traveling there with everything and the hotels and the food yeah. and everything. So, yeah, yeah. I mean you spend, you spend 10x – what the booth costs on everything else. <laughs> yeah. And to put it into perspective, the, so in 2018, when you're, when I was participating in Launchpad, we had a small booth, like a kiosk yeah. in, in the, in the area where new exhibitors are. And I brought built right lanyards and I, I brought a hundred and I was able to give away about 50. And, and in 2019, in this, in this much better location, I gave away the 2,500 that I had in before the second day of the show was over. <laughs> so it's there's major difference. Okay. Kind of depending on where you are. Yeah, yeah. And that was always my complaint with SEMA is they don't <clears throat> they don't mix they really if they mix that show up it'd be I would I would go again. I, I don't care to go anymore because it's it's the same people in the same spot of the main halls and everybody yeah. else is pushed off to the outside. And to me that just totally destroys any ingenuity, any like new products and bringing new people into the industry. Cause it's literally the same people every time. Uh, yeah. P- PRI, to be fair, I think that, I think that in 2019 they did, I think that they're making an effort to improve that. Okay. PRI so, has I'm, always I'm been really good about it. And it's the same people, which is kind of baffling to me. PRI, like you can, they move everybody around. Like we get moved around in the place we were at. There were different people at every booth. And so I kind of like that where you kind of explore around and see some new products. And I just never got that feeling for the, whatever five or six years we were at SEMA It's literally the same thing in the main halls. And if you're saying it's different, then maybe I should go back again. <laughs> well, I, so. I think that those, the tents that were kind of no man's land before yeah. they kind of, they made them or one of them like an overland theme this year. Okay. Um, so I think they're kind of re- they're reshuffling a little bit. Sure. So okay. that's uh, you know m- moving in the right direction. Hopefully, someone from SEMA is listening to this that has some sway in that. I don't <laughs> think so, but <laughs> well, I think I think probably you, you, there's a good chance of that. <laughs> okay. So how many hours a week are you working still? Um, that's a that's a harder question to answer now than it than it used to be. Uh, I mean, you know, and probably a lot of people listening know it kind of never stops. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I could put a number on it because. Um, you know, anytime there's kind of a vacuum, I guess, as far as time or mental bandwidth goes, it's filled with work. So I'm still spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week in the office, in the shop. Um, and then, you know, working nights and weekends and stuff a lot from home. Um, one of the biggest challenges for me in the last year is when we moved uh, from Minnesota to Connecticut in the beginning of 2019, we had a two month old. Um, and having an infant has really made it hard to, yeah. uh, uh, create a routine. Yep. So that's, that's been kind of a big challenge and it's something that I'm really looking forward to here in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah. And it gets even worse as they get older because then it's like, Oh, oh great. You become a taxi <laughs> to all the things that they want to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's something to look forward to. Okay. We'll make it work. And so managing the business itself, like what kind of tools are you using for that? So, you know, I would assume you probably started with QuickBooks, but. And you're still, I still, you're probably still in a range where that still works for you. But I know the manufacturing people like to push out to different types of software for that. What, what are you doing to run the business? Yeah, I'm still in QuickBooks uh, desktop so that I can manage the um, the manufacturing side of it a little bit with um, assembly parts and assemblies and stuff. Sure. Um, but I am kind of constantly on the lookout for what what is that next step because I don't want to get so far into it that it's that it's hard to move. I don't want to have thousands and thousands of uh, part numbers in QuickBooks before it's time to migrate. So uh-huh. 
that's something that's on the radar this year is to uh, find a little bit better, more mature solution for that. Okay. And you were saying you were doing some of your manufacturing in your basement. I'm assuming you still do some manufacturing, but <clears> I, <throat> I can't imagine you do all of it, right? No, no. And it's, I've, uh, uh, um, we do all of our own, uh, product assembly and packaging and stuff. Okay. Um, and then we've partnered with, uh, other local manufacturers to help us with, you know, commercial sewing or machining, sheet metal fabrication, that sort of stuff. So we're really focused heavily on product design, prototyping and, um, you know, sales marketing f- okay. fulfillment. Sure. Uh, and then the guys with the million dollar pieces of equipment, they can, uh, they can make the parts. Make parts and you just give so, them a little yep. cut of it and they're happy and you're happy, right? <laughs> yep. Cool. Yep. And it's it, also that's also uh, uh, it's that's very scalable compared to buying my own equipment at, at this point. Okay, and and you you don't have to be a master seamstress anymore, huh? <laughs> no, no. Although I, I do break out the sewing machine periodically if I'm prototyping. We're 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 digging deeper into the soft goods product line that we have with our our tech panels. Okay, um, and I I enjoy prototyping and stuff. So I've been dusting off those skills recently so you'll see some new products uh, possibly <laughs> before this before this uh, goes live we'll see okay so tell me this has this venture been worth it does is the pay monetary financially been worth it yet yes okay. yes yeah I, I have like a like a, a more elegant answer to that question which is you know is the pay monetary or you know there's so much more to it but you you really got right down to it there um yeah 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 so um, one of the, so we kind of actually hit a milestone a couple of months ago, which is that um, built right now uh, by the metrics is bigger than Grim Speed was when I left. Holy cow! Which the, the the only significance that has to me is that it kind of gives me this bit of encouragement. Like, all right, everything you've seen, everything you're going to see, you know, in the next few years, these are things that you've done before. These are challenges that you faced before. You know, I can anticipate things better. Um, you know, and kind of have a better understanding of what the next few years looks like. So, okay. um, but yeah, yeah. Fantastic, man. That is so impressive. <laughs> you, Thank leave, you. you leave a company that was already pretty well established and, uh, in, I guess three years have already surpassed that on your own, huh? It's amazing. Uh, surpassed, surpassed uh, where it was when I started there. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't, okay. I don't, I don't remember what I said, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So still impressive. We're, we're, we're closing in. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I guess, uh, looking forward here, do you have a one year plan? Um, yeah, new, new makes and new models. We've spent the last year kind of getting our feet under us here and, and maturing the back end of the business, kind of building out that infrastructure in the process. Um, and we're, we're ready to get into GMC, Chevy, Toyota, Ram, uh, our Jeep stuff has been really successful so far. Yeah. You, so bought, you it's, bought a Gladiator, uh, right? That was yours? Or you, yes. Okay. Yep. As a, yep. as a prototype vehicle, essentially, huh? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. For, for product development and, I mean, you know, some manufacturers participate in the SEMA tech transfer program where you can get CAD models yeah. eventually. But still, if you want, if you need measurements and, and vehicles for testing the best way to do it right is away, the vehicle, yeah. you, you have to own the vehicle. Yes, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. And uh, OK, so this is something that uh, I think we had hit you up on up on a, maybe maybe probably about a year ago now. So we were looking at getting into F-150s and we are still in that process. Uh, we contacted you about like you know, like being an installer or dealer, what do you do with that? Is there like a dealer program or do you just kind of, I mean, your stuff is not that hard to install. So a lot of it can be DIY, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's part of the kind of the, the design process. And even part of the products that I pick is to make sure that they are easy to install. Um, because a lot of my customers in the truck market are not even necessarily enthusiasts. Um, they're not interested in, spending time in the garage, they, they want to buy products that work and install them. And if they can't do it easily themselves, they find somebody that can do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, uh, we kind of, so I, I remember when you and I spoke about a year ago, yeah, it was, it was about a year ago. Okay. <clears throat> um, part of, part of it for us is being able to support guys like you and, um, getting on board with turn 14 is a, is a piece of that. Okay. Um, sure. so okay. that, so that the product is more readily available uh-huh. and, um, but yeah, installation's fast. So we're working with, um, like the largest Ford dealership in the country is inventorying and, and, and installing our products. And there's more margin on the install than there is even on the product because okay. it's, it's very straightforward. So that's kind of part of the, 
that's kind of part of the 2020 landscape as well. Yeah, that applies to everything I do, though. <laughs> more margin <laughs> on fair. the installs than there is on the parts. But that's it, fair. It, it's, it's hard when you're trying to sell an Exedi twin clutch or something, and it's like, oh, okay, I buy it for $1,172, and MA Performance has got it on sale for $1,150. How am I supposed to make money on this again? I don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it's, things are changing. We'll see. But anyway. Um, okay, so... You, you kind of laid out a one-year plan, more year makes and models. What do you, is this like something you want to stick with and keep growing, or is this something you want to get big and then unload it, or what's your five-year plan? Um, I, I, have a, I have a bit of a plan, and it's always subject to change because yep. I know that my interests and stuff are always evolving. Um, I'm still very interested in what happens with electric vehicles. Um, I'm keeping track, of, obviously, of the, the Rivian and the Tesla Cybertruck. Sure. Um, in the next five years, certainly we'll continue to build built right. I think that there's, uh, plenty more than five years of, of great, exciting work to do. Um, but I know that, um, I already have other, other ideas and other interests. And, um, I think that it's, it's fair to assume that you will see me start other brands probably within built right in the next few years. Um, and kind of hopefully, work to build out a leadership team where uh, I can have some time to be chasing those things down okay. um, while directing the rest of the business. So Fantastic. And uh, the nice thing is your your product is immune to the, C, uh, the um, EPA and any emissions regulation because you can bolt the stuff on any car and there's nobody can stop you from doing any of that, huh? <laughs> that that was also that was a, that was a strategic move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it doesn't matter if it's an electric truck or a gas truck or a diesel truck or powered by a foot pedal. If you got Fred Flintstone pushing it, you can still make a product for it and sell it, huh? Also an intentional decision. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yep. There's a lot, a lot of a lot of things changing, and you can only kind of control your piece of it. So. All right. Well, I love. This has been a fantastic update, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time for it. Um, is there what? How does our listeners check out your products? You know, get in touch with you if they have questions. How do we? How do we do that? Uh, to check out the products, certainly our website builtrightind.com or, or industries.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook or Instagram at builtrightindustries.com. Um, if you want to email me directly, it's Matt at builtrightind.com. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, or, or pick up the phone. We're happy to answer. Awesome. Matt, I really appreciate this and congratulations on this, uh, fantastic growth you've had. And, uh, it's really, it's super impressive. And I think people, uh, should pay really close attention to what you did and how you did it. Cause uh, it's like a, it's a model for how to start and grow a business. It really is. So thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's fun to catch up and it's, it's a nice opportunity for me to Take a minute and, and look back instead of forward. So. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash do it for a living and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button. When you subscribe, you help us gain momentum and attract more high-level guests. Thanks for listening, and good luck. <laughs>